Hey everyone, we are live with my good friend Brent Abel. Um, really a tennis stud. I mean, he's won 14 gold balls, which is incredible. And I love having him on because it, it's so cool. You know, we go through, um, you know, these doubles points and, and Brent, you know, breaks them down and asks us, you know, what is the right shot? So it really requires a lot of thinking and concentration. But uh, I want to thank you, Brent, for coming on. How have you been? Well, um, Mirabon, listen, uh, always a, a treat to, to be on with you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your invite this year. Uh, always, always a lot of fun. And, and things are, things, uh, things are good. Uh, you know, we're, we're here in the desert, Southern California desert, Rancho Mirage, the Mission Hills Country Club. And, uh, you know, if you're into tennis at all, this is a tennis mecca. I mean, it's just unbelievable. We got 10, uh, I think of the world's best uh, grass tennis courts here. We got four clay that are decent and uh, a boatload of hard courts. So depending on what tournament you're trying to get ready for, um, other than indoor, uh, we, you know, we got the whole package here. So, um, so it's good. And uh, my first year in the new age group in the 75s, um, you know, I've won a couple tournaments already this year. So I uh, just got back from Houston, Texas uh, about three weeks ago when the 75 singles there, the indoors, and uh, heading off to Baton Rouge, Louisiana tomorrow uh, for for a clay court tournament, um, and looking forward to that. So, no complaints, man. All's good. Awesome, awesome. Um, really excited for you. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you back late. Uh, you know, in a week or so, uh, Monday. Yeah, as, as we discussed before you <laughs> before we went live, if I'm back by Friday or Saturday, not good. Not good. <laughs> No, no, you're fine. You, yeah. you, you'll you'll enjoy either way, but I'm sure you'll go far. So, yeah, say hello to us in the chat if you are here. I do see a bunch of people streaming in, so that's excellent. Um, yeah, Brent, uh, it's really excited again, you know, to talk to you today about double strategy. I know for myself, um, with the USCA leagues, I, like I'm playing probably like 90% doubles, you know, just the way that the leagues are situated. You know, I'll, I'll sometimes you'll have like these singles leagues uh, on occasion, or if you're on a, a, a men's team, maybe you'll have like one quarter of um, singles, at least for the, you know, five O leagues and then two doubles. But a lot of times you'll have like the very top five O's who are really five fives playing that. So uh, really excited to hear about how you break down doubles points. And, and I saw that you have a, a, a cool um, bunch of slides for us. So uh, I'll let you just launch in. <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty basic, um, you know, pretty Spartan on the slides. Uh, and, and, I'll and I'll tell you what I wanted to do. I know that we've done a lot of the uh, what's the right shot stuff in the past. <clears throat> and what I like to do today, Mirabon, is really kind of dig into the doubles return of serve. And um, go through three basic things. Number one, the mindset, because there's a real specific mindset you got to have with returning serve and doubles. Uh, number two, some technique. And I'll just give you the technique that that works for me. And uh, and then just the basic strategy. And, you know, it's it all sounds pretty simple, but. Um, and I and, and then and then I guess the fourth thing I want to give you, too, is <clears throat> excuse me, is I want to give you a little a little practice drill for how either two guys you need at least two guys but if you have three guys it's perfect um four guys gets a little cumbersome because you want you want as many reps as possible but um, i'm going to give you that uh, that practice drill as well awesome thanks so much brent really excited about this and the drills especially to put what we learn into practice i'm um, just a quick a few quick shout outs here we got our friend peter freeman from crunch time coaching the great lefty just the great That's lefty right. from Atlanta, Georgia. And by the way, Peter, I'll be in Atlanta starting. Where are we? This is, I'll be in there. May Atlanta senior invitational starts May 10th. I'll probably get there around the eighth. So Peter, hopefully we can, we can, uh, we can connect when I'm, when I'm there. Oh yes. Yes. You, you boys have to do that. that. That'd be awesome. Pete's Pete's awesome as, as you are Brent, uh, Melissa. Hey again, happy Monday. Um, Great to see you again, Melissa. Uh, Bruce, yes, Brent has amazing ability. <laughs> ab oh, ability. That one, I, that one I've never, ever heard. Yes. You know, I, of I, course, I always get the, you know, ready, willing, and able. And I go, gosh, mm. I've never heard that one before. But the abilities, I love that. Able. Nice, yeah. nice. Good one. Good one. and able. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, awesome. that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't fare too oh. well in that one. <laughs> oh man uh jude hey marabon brent what's up ray nunez california a fellow californian all right 
Nice. And Teresa, this is my first summit. Awesome. I'm excited. I'm excited for you. This is our seventh summit. It's crazy. Um, Stephanie, he used to SoCal open tennis tournaments are so expensive to play in these days, especially if you lose round one. What do yes, you think true. about that, Brent? Yeah, true? yeah, no, it's, 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 it's really true. I mean, the USDA is charging a ton of money to play and, and, you know, the whole thing has always been, well, it's a great lesson if you lose in the first round to someone who's good. And, and I don't know if I've ever bought that really what tournaments should be trying to do is your first match. If you lose in the first round or if you get a buy in the first round and you lose that second uh, round match, so first match uh, that you that you don't win, there ought to be a backdrop. There ought to be some yeah. kind of consolation because with the prices that we're paying, I think it's just going to kill tournaments. And, and look, don't get me going on the USTA politically, um, but I wouldn't doubt if some <laughs> sinister thing is going on where they'd like to just do leagues and not tournaments. Mm. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree, Stephanie, that... Uh, um, and I've actually thought about that before. There are some tournaments out here where the same complaint goes on. You know what? We're, we're losing first round. We're paying, we're paying a ton of money. And I thought, why not? Why not during the same week at a different site, just host um, another event for those players that do not win that first match and make it fun and make it instructive. Yeah. You know, I mean, have them play, have them play a bunch of matches in, um, and so you got to get at least two matches if you enter a tournament, I think. Totally, totally. I remember the days when, you know, tournaments were like 20 bucks. And then now I've seen like, you know, like 80 and, and higher. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, 100% agreed. Let's see. A couple more um, before we get started. Um, Bill Green is looking forward to my new and improved game. Yes, for sure. There's so much great material uh, this week. Mike, uh, hey, Brent, hope it's going well. Just came back from NTRP Nationals. Very cool. Uh, the great Mike Rogers from Northern California. Um, and here's a guy that is right in my wheelhouse in terms of a coaching student that, mm. um, you know, I, I hate to I, I hate to throw out, uh, throw out NTRP ratings out there because they're never really 100 percent accurate. But, uh, you know, Mike's a guy who just kind of caught the, the tournament bug and um, and. And myself and, and Jeff Jacklich from, from Napa have, have been helping him, Jeff, mostly recently. But a guy who caught the bug and literally is entering as many events as he possibly can, uh, depending on work schedule and that kind of thing, doing some traveling, spending some money, playing a lot of league stuff. Um, and so that's really the recipe in the end. I mean, you can take lessons from pros all day long, but if you don't go out there and – and get beat up and and start you know losing first second round something like that coming back and going coach i need to work on this um whatever but that's the way to do it uh because i've always thought that the coaching par part mayor bond is maybe at best 15 percent of the learning curve mm -hmm. of the learning process someone getting better the other stuff is what are you what are you doing for the 85 percent of the rest of the time which is getting out there back on court 17, you're all by yourself. You take a little bag of balls out there. You know, you got 50 balls in the bag. You hit 50 serves. You go pick them up. Uh, you, you drop and hit 54 hands. You drop and hit 50 backhands, whatever you go to tournaments. You you know, you, you do all this stuff. And, and, and then the other big component of, of, of all this, which is the number one controllable is fitness. If you hmm. really want to become a better player even if you're not doing all the stuff I just said, if if you get the kitchen right and you get the gym right, it's inevitable. You're going to get better even if you play the same amount of tennis. So my hat's off to guys like like Mike Rogers for sure. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. A few quick, uh, quick ones. Uh, Alan. Hey, how are you? North Carolina. Awesome. Um, Halil Istanbul. Love that. That's so cool. Mike, the Wilson world should have a backdrop. Mm more backdrops please yeah no um, no he's he's absolutely right it, you know it's true yeah or do a round robin in the early rounds yeah um lynn new hampshire awesome mike see you in atlanta playing 65s and father's son get got back from boys you know unfortunately recovering okay covid hope you okay, feel better mike. soon all right um and then jimbo manchester are you a city or united fan let me know all right so uh with that i'll oh one more sorry peter I'll do a TikTok dance if we get to 200. Please, everybody. Well, I guess they're not here, so they don't know. But 
Uh, I hope we get to 200 so we can see Pete um, dance. So, uh, Brent, I'll let you take it from here and then go okay. back to the comments. So, yeah. Let me see if I can make uh, StreamYard work for me. I know it works great for you there, Mirabon. Uh, yeah, no worries. Take your time. I'll just look okay. at more uh, comments here. here. And then let me, let, me, let me know if you can see it. Oh, yeah. I can see it. Perfect. I'll add to stream. All Is right. Is that still good right there? All right. Um, so, look, um, a little different than what's the right shot. I really want to kind of dig into – some mindset, some technique, a little bit of strategy, and then a little practice uh, drill for you guys today. And um, so uh, let's get rolling here. And, you know, the first thing is I want to give you a little flavor of, and this is yours truly with the return of serve. Um, this is a this is the National Hard Courts, Irvine, California, a couple of years ago. Um, but I want to give you really the first thing is the mindset especially when you've got an active server's partner up there. And, and this is kind of what we're going to, this is what we're going to be able to get you hopefully to feel is. So let's start with, let's start with the mindset and, you know, we got to have a target in mind and the biggest mistake that we make, and this is something that I used to do ad nauseum. It would just, it, it, it was not great. And I can't remember, I can't remember whoever kind of gave me, gave me this, this, this nugget, but, but what your target is not, it's not keep away from the service partner. And, and I think too often what happens is, is we're really focused on not playing our return to the service partner. And the problem with that is the service partner is a moving target. So what we typically do since it's a moving target is, and I'm not saying that that they're poaching all the time, and I'm not saying that they are fake poaching all the time. They should be, but they're not. But we get distracted with that possibility of them poaching. And so what happens is we're always sort of giving a little peek out there. Guy hits the serve, and as the serve is coming in, it, it just it, – it, it, it ends up that we want to make sure that we know where the server's partner is at all times. So we're not totally focused on the ball. We're not watching the ball – the serve bounce into the service box and bounce up into, um, into either our forehand or backhand. So here's what it is. And, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a little graphic and, and, and we can really kind of dive into this, but, but what your target is, it's a specific area above the top of the net that equates to a landing spot over there, usually at the intersection of the service line and the single sideline. So what that means is that if you look cross court, um, that there's that the, the uh, service line and the single sideline intersect at a corner there. And for me, if I can return serve there on a consistent basis, even if, even if the service partner poaches, um, then, then good things happen. And we're going to break serve more. We're going to break serve more often, even if the guy goes, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I fit my target, which again is not that spot. I'm talking about the intersection. It's a spot above the top of the net that equates to that landing spot over there. And the reason that I say it's a spot above the top of the net, that's much more of a tangible target, um, than, than looking through the net, which is an obstacle. You know, we're trying to hit over the net. So every time we look at a spot through the net, which, you know, if you're the normal height and you're back in the baseline returning serve, you can't you can't look over the top of the net to that spot. So for me, it's just it's way easier if I just find a spot above the top of the net. And uh, and here's kind of the graphic. So really what I'm thinking here is if I get a forehand or I get a backhand is that my spot is going to be this area right here, this little green area, which is the spot above the top of the net. And for me, that equates to if I get it there, it's going to land at the intersection there of the service line um, and the single sideline. So I've eliminated this player. I've eliminated this player from my mind. I'm not concerned about them. And I have to trust that if I hit my spot, even if they poach, that uh, it's going to work out okay. Now, look, if they poach so early that, that this might not be a great target, if they go that early and I see it, okay, well then – then you can you can adjust and you can kind of you know hit your return forehand back end up the line, and uh, and it's good. So hope that makes sense. Um, 
simple strategy. You know, your primary job as the returner is to play your return directly in front of your partner. I mean, that's why we have our 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 partners who are returning serves starting up at net. They're not starting back in the baseline. Occasionally, they'll start back in the baseline if we've got a server who's just bombing huge first serves, especially, and it's all we can do to get it back. And it's really setting up the server's partner. So in that case, sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and on the first serve, have my partner back up to the, to the baseline. And But second serve, no. So your job is to get the ball in front of your partner uh, because it's an advantage to have your partner up there. And from there, now your partner has an opportunity to kind of take over. Either they can they can throw in a little fake poach, be distracting. They can poach. They can do they can do several things. If the service partner poaches a lot, uh, then open up your cross court lane. And the way that you do that is you got to show them a few lobs up the line. You got to hit some drives directly at them. I don't really try to take a drive and go up the go up the alley because every time I do that, it's I'm, I'm my mindset is I'm trying to hit a quote unquote winner. And, and for me, that's just a bad thought because um, too often we try to over hit when we try to think winner. So all I'm trying to do is think this is a two shot return to serve play. I'm going to play it directly at them and I'm assuming it's coming back. I'm assuming that I'm going to tie up some stroke technique. I'm assuming they're going to kind of be able to kind of reflex it back. But from there, either myself or my partner will be able to have an easier ball to do some damage with. So uh, if you really want to open up that cross court lane, that strategic return where you're getting the ball directly in front of your partner, allowing them to do something, then if you've got someone who's really poaching a lot, you gotta you gotta be in charge of making sure that that cross court lane stays open. The way I do it is I throw in a few lobs and I threw a couple of drives right at them and get them thinking that they can't they just can't poach um, as much as they are. And look. The bottom line in all this stuff is that this is this is an un uncontrollable. You can't if you've picked out your target over there and and you know you can't stop them from poaching, right? There's so many things in tennis that we're just out of our control. So a lot of doubles and, and singles as well is kind of a, a best guess, right? I don't think he's going to cross, or I don't think she's going to cross um, on this return. So I'm going cross court. Right. If they go early and you see it, then you can adjust. Um, but even if you guess that they're not going to go a best guess and they do, that's just the nature of the game. And and then what I like to do is go to school in the first few return games. Do they actually poach a lot? And the reality is, Mayor Bond, is most serving partners don't don't poach a lot. And um, so anyway. The whole thing here, the whole mindset is let's not be concerned with that with that service partner. Let's pick out let's pick out our own targets and let's put the confidence in ourselves that there were that 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 we're the ones in charge. Um, I'm going to go through some technique here, and this is this is a little detailed, but um, and it's not that it's not that I go through this checklist every time I'm returning serve. I might have one one cue for me. And the biggest cue for me when I'm returning serves is really is is another one of these uh, bullets bullets coming down that I'll that I'll mention to you. But but the very first thing is you got to face the server so that when you line up, you're not actually parallel to the baseline. You're not parallel to the net. You're actually you're actually facing cross court to the server so that you are sort of bisecting the server's angles coming in at you. And now you can turn to hit a forehand. You can turn to hit a backhand where, um, where you're sort of at a 50-50 bisection point there by facing the server and not necessarily facing where your chest is facing uh, the server's partner. Um, and, and what I do is, is I find the ball in the server's hand, right? I don't want to be looking at the server's face or I don't want to be looking at anything other than the tennis ball. So before they start their motion, I've located the ball in their hand and I want to watch the ball as it goes up. So that my first and only thought is, you know, the old thing was you got to watch the ball. Well, for me, I need to lock in on the tennis ball when it's in their hand before they start their, before they start their motion. Another big thing here is especially on big points is you got to stay soft, soft hands in the racket, any kind of grip tension, does a couple of bad things. Grip tension means that it, you know, you start to 
you start to contract muscles. And a lot of the times you start to contract facial muscles, right? This is all through tension. And once you do that, you don't see the ball as well. You don't see the ball as well when you start to get tight in your hands and it works its way up in your face. So you want to have a relaxed alertness. But the other reason you want to have soft hands on the handle is that when you come into your split step, and this is what I do, not everyone does this, and I would encourage everyone to try this. If it works, great. Keep doing it. If it doesn't, if you've got another way of doing it, that's fine too. But but what I do is as the tossing motion on the server is the ball's going up, I take one forward step, and you'll see it, um, you'll see it in the videos coming up. I take one forward step into a split step as they toss. And then I react to the direction of that incoming serve um, with a split step, but it's with a full shoulder turn. I don't think racket back as much. I think more shoulder turn because when I get my shoulders totally committed, totally turned, the racket gets set. I don't have to think about it. There's too often where I see players who don't turn at all. They put the racket back, but it doesn't really get them lined up to be able to have a natural forward swing back cross court to that server. So um, this, is a, this is another important thing with the shoulder turn of why you need to have soft hands. And it took me forever to trust that I don't need to have a firm grip in my ready position. I don't need to have a firm grip when I turn because when I do those things, I don't really get a full turn. I'm slower reacting, I'm slower turning, and I'm, I don't really get a full shoulder turn so that I can have a forward swing either forehand or backhand. So You've got to really trust that when you have soft hands that it's going to work out, that really the only time you might firm up your, your, your grip is just a hair before contact. Other than that, there's no, there's no reason, there's no need to ever have to uh, squeeze, squeeze the racket handle. And then once you get turned, you see the serve to your right forehand if you're right-handed, see the serve to your left um, backhand if you're right-handed, or you see the service coming directly at you, all right, well, you've got to create some space with your feet, right? You're now in a full turn position. You're ready to swing. You've committed to either forehand or backhand, but you've got to move your feet to create the needed spatial distance you need so that the path of that incoming serve is not eating you up, right? It's not just, it's not directly at you. And, you know, here's a little, you know, strategy for me when I'm serving, I'm going first serve to the body probably 80% of the time. And then the other 10% I'm going out wide and the other 10% I'm going, I'm going down the tee. But, you know, especially as we get older in age groups, you know, we're not as quick with the, with the, with the feet. So I'm forcing someone, even though I'm going directly at them, and even though I know they're going to be able to get a racket on the ball, and even though I assume it's coming back, if it's going to come back, I'd rather have it come back with compromised stroke technique by forcing them to have to have good spacing with their feet and, you know, if you hit a decent serve, first serve, lots of times, lots of times the spacing over there is not great. So you've really got to be able to make sure that anytime a ball's coming directly at you, your feet are creating the spacing, or if the balls are out wide or down to the tee that you've, that you've got your feet moving. And look, this doesn't work every time, right? If you can't free, freely swing to your target spot, you're either jammed or way out wide, then I just lob. I don't try to force it over there. If someone, if a guy serves to me tight to the body and I can't get out of the way, I'm not going to force it cross court over to that target because, as we just mentioned, stroke technique for, for me will be compromised. I'm just going to lock. And the th same thing out wide. If I get pulled way, way out wide, there's no reason to go cross court because the angle's not great and I probably won't be able to recover. So I'm just going to lock. Um, and then here's another thing that really has been big for me. And I think that is probably the one thing, Mayor Bond, that I tell myself, I remind myself every time I return serve, is this whole no peaking, right? We talked about in the very beginning is that your mindset's got to be that you, you get the server's partner out of your mind. Well, one of the reasons that we can have all these other things, all the bullets that come down this last one working out well, but if you peek, if you sneak a peek to see what that server's partner's doing, Typically what happens is your timing gets thrown off. Typically what happens is the swing path gets, gets a little thrown off and you don't make contact and you're not confident with your swing. So what I try to do is what I call is the look of fed, right? And the look of fed is 
we've seen Federer, how he how he just seems to be looking at the point of contact of a forehand or backhand forever. And the ball is, you know, well over there to the opponent, but he's still looking down at that, at that point of contact. And for me, that's the one thing I have to really make sure that I remind myself of is, well, I say there's two things. Number, I, I say turn and just, just no, I don't even say no peak. I just say down and down. The word down for me means keep looking down at that contact point well after I've made contact. So, <clears throat> so that's, um, those, those are the technical things. Um, here's a quick drill that you can do. I said before, you can do this with two guys or you can do it with three guys. But um, what I like to do is I put a towel out here and I put a towel, kind of drape it over the net. It's just a, you know, this is not to scale, but um, I put a towel over here that, that, that when the serve comes to my forehand or backhand, all I'm thinking about is I want to hit a spot above the towel. All right. And and that and that spot above the towel equates to this landing area right here, um, the white, the white square right there. And and what I like to have is three guys for we got a server, we got a returner and we've got this guy up here really trying to visually distract, not with a poach, but with a big fake poach. And in the beginning for the returner, it, it is distracting. Right. And and eventually you start to desensitize yourself to whatever movement is going on up here. And and then after a while, this guy can eventually throw in a poach. He can actually go. Um, but once the returner kind of gets desensitized to any movement up here and is really thinking about that spot over there, I think what you'll find if you hit that spot, that um, that this part that this server's partner is not really getting a good play in the ball. They might get to it and pop it up, and that's fine. Um, <clears throat> but that's the whole purpose of the server's partner, right? The purpose of the server's partner is to be a visual distraction for this returner, to make them think about the returner, and to make them, if nothing else, slow down the returner's swing speed so that even if you don't cross, if you throw in a big fake poach, and slow down the swing speed, whatever comes back is much easier for, for the, for the uh, server's partner, for the server. So what I like to do is, is, is have the server hit, you know, and I start off by saying, look, let's go 10 here to the forehand. Let's go 10 here to the backhand. And there's 20. And then you can rotate. You know, you, you guys figure out the rotation is, and then maybe you come around again, and now you start serving to the body every time. And you start getting some, some footwork spacing required in here but the entire time you've got this little towel right here and your target is a spot above that and i think what you'll find is once you go out and once you go out and play the match and you've actually done this drill several times i mean the first national I ever won was back in the 35s and um it was my second year in the 35s first year we played the hardcore stand in san antonio we got beat in the first round we thought we were pretty good northern california we go down there we get beat first round badly and we came back and just, well, you know, God, dang, we got to work on the return to serve here. I stayed around for a few extra days after getting beat and watched the top teams. And they just weren't hitting the ball any bigger than we were, but they were consistently returning serve. And so for the next year, we, after we got back, we, I just had my partner, Rob. I mean, he would serve to me probably five days a week. We would do this drill for about an hour and we'd just play cross court points, cross court points, just the two of us. And then he'd do that for 15 minutes and, 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 and then we'd, you know, and, and then we'd switch and I'd serve, you know, I'd serve from the ad side because he was the ad sort of uh, the ad side returner. I was the do side returner. And after one year, the next year we came back and we won, we won the, uh, we won the, the same tournament the next year. So this stuff pays off um, if you'll, if you'll do it. So uh, where are we here? Um, strategy. Um, I think I've already gone through this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've already been through this. All right. Let me just make sure I haven't missed anything here. Yeah, all sure. right. Good. Good. Um, all right. So let's do this. I want to go to, um, I want to go to another, first of all, do we have any questions? Because, because right now I'm going to bring up a video and um, I'm going to show you these return points and we're going to kind of walk through That's what right. we just talked about. We're going to walk through the mindset. We're going to walk through the technique and um, and the strategy from there. Um, yeah, 
just a couple, Brent, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, awesome. So first one from Mike T T. Uh, and adjust position based on how wide the server is. Yeah, sure. I mean, if the server goes way out wide, wide in the devil's alley, um, you know, if I'm sure I'm, I'm going to go ahead and probably inch my way out into my own alley. Um, yeah. And I'm going to make them prove to me that, um, uh, you know, that they can't ding it now back up the T. Right. So if they're going to go way, way out wide, well, I'm just going to kind of mirror that position and see some guys can do it. Most guys can't. Right. Most guys will go out wide and they're just trying to get you out wide. That's fine. I don't mind doing that. You know, when they do that and the server's partner knows that, hey, my partner is way, way out wide on that alley to serve. Well, now if I'm pulled that wide, they're going to have to kind of honor the fact that I might go up their line and they start to move over as well. So. You definitely have to adjust your position depending on where the server is. And I've played against some servers who like to serve literally like they're playing singles and they're and they're and they're serving from the T. You know, they're serving from that little center mark. So look, all this stuff is you should go to school. And I kind of I just kind of like the opportunity. I like the different looks. Um, I like to see what what different players bring. And um, and so um, yeah, you got you got to adjust. Yeah, I definitely adjust my position uh, as well. Um, you know, sometimes you get these players who like, kind of like you said, like if they'll move towards the tee and then they like serve down the tee or they move wider, they serve wider. Uh, occasionally you get the ones who are serving, you know, like they're in singles. So it's, it's interesting, but I definitely agree with, with your um, advice there, Brent. Um, so Teresa said, um, asked, what did Brent mean by go to school the first few games, watch your opponent's preferences? I think she's on the right track. What do you, yeah, no, no, no right? she's definitely right. Yeah. And okay. um, um, yeah, go to school to me, Teresa means I'm just in a learning mode. I, I, I want to sort of probe. And I want to see what their what their tendencies are. If a guy serves me down the tee, and I go and I go back cross court, I want to see I want to see if there's any movement up there. Typically, there's not, right? If if the guy takes me out wide and I kind of slide one back back cross court, what do they do? Um, and so it's just really and and sometimes sometimes the tendencies are how places that serve or how 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 close is that server's partner playing to the net. If they're really playing tight to the net, well, I'm going to take what they're giving me. And, and what they're giving me right now is the, is, the, is the opportunity to lob. Rather than thinking, well, I'm going to have to just, you know, jam this through a tight little window over there cross court. If they're tight in the net, all right, thank you. Because to me, the lob return is just an approach shot. It's nothing more. You know, if I, if I return cross court, especially in the second serve, it's a re it's just a return approach. I want to join my partner up at the net as soon as I can. And the lob <laughs> is pretty much automatic. I mean, you lob, why would you stay back? I'm coming in. So it's really going going to school for me is just I'm trying to I'm trying to measure and find out what their tendencies are. Against, you know, un unknown opponent. Eventually you play someone, you know them well enough, and all right, you've gone to school, you know what they do. Yeah, great stuff. And yeah, one point that I remember you saying that hitting, you know, at the net player, like when you want to go down the line. I mean, that's so true. I mean, for me, you know, when I'm playing matches, like if the person's going, uh, you know, the down the line is like wide open. You don't have to hit like some amazing sort exactly. of shot. Just yeah. hitting it in that half, mo you know, most of the time you're hitting a winner. Um, if you can read their, their post. Well, I think right. the other thing too is if you try to go up the line, if you try to go up the alley and they don't go, um, you know, you're, you're feeding them a volley right to their side. Right. And, and they really, mm -hmm. you know, if they've got decent volley technique, that's what they want. That's why I'd rather, I'd rather target them in terms of thinking, well, here's a two shot play. I'm not trying to try to win the point outright. Cause I don't, I, I don't think at any age group, I mean, it's all relative, you know, younger age groups get the ball bigger, but they volley better. Right. So older age groups, not as big, but don't volley as well. So, um, I think of it as a two shot play right to the body. And I'm assuming it's coming back. That's okay. And whatever comes back, we'll just take it from there. You ever been called Brent, the bully Brent, if you're, when you go at them and they get pissed off at you no, or no, anything like that? No, no. I mean, <laughs> no, um, 
Because yeah. in the second serve, if it's a real set, if it's a real sitter, second serve, um, I don't really go with the net person because I just feel like the advantage is to do whatever I want to do now cross court. I just think on a sitter, second serve, they're not going to move. And, yeah. and so to me in the long run, I'd rather go cross court, put the ball in front of my partner, play it as an approach shot. And over the long haul, we'll win more points doing that. Um, no, I've never, I've never, I've never been called the bully. No. <laughs> yeah, you're too, you're too nice of a guy. And then also, um, well, when you or when an opponent serves at your body, you know, and you have to lob it up there, um, I know it is a little bit hard to control. But do you have a preference for like where you're lobbing that? Are you lobbing it, you know, down the line, cross court? Ah, uh, well, that's 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 a good question. I mean, typically, I'm going, I'm not so much going up the alley because. Um, I just don't have much space there. So if I'm, you know, if the ball is a little wide and I, and I, I go up the alley too much, it's wide. I mean, to me, the lob feels like, it feels like I should never miss it ever. And if you, if you try to make it too fine in that alley, it, it makes no sense. I'm assuming that that server is going to probably get it anyway. And so I, it doesn't really make any difference to me if it's in the alley or if it's halfway between the single sideline and the center mark. I get the same result, which is I, I, I get to come in and play it as an approach shot. And, and so um, now if I'm, if I'm on the do side and we're playing against a right-handed player and I feel like I can control the lob, I am going to lob up of, over, over their backhand. And, mm -hmm. and here's where, you know, you know, call me a bully, but, but I, I'm actually looking to play it not so deep that it's an automatic cross. It's an automatic yours. I want to play it just deep enough that the server's partner feels like they got to cover it with a high backhand as they're, as they're moving backwards. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's like the golden opportunity. <laughs> yeah. It's a golden opportunity with this high backhand and they're moving backwards and you know, they're not going to be able to step forward through it. Even if it comes back, they're still going to keep moving backwards the baseline, and now we're both up at net. So, um, you know, and I won't call it a defensive lob, the first one we were talking about. It's just an approach shot, you know, and approach shots is, you know, if you know Jeff Jacklich, he's always said approach shots, whether it's a standard approach, drive, chip, slice, lob, it should never be a failed winner attempt. You should never be thinking about approach shots as – this is a winner opportunity because too often we miss. So I always think about this. I'm playing it deep. I'm coming in. I'm assuming it's coming back. We'll take it from there. Yeah. Love that. Love that. We've got so many questions, Brent. I'll try to sneak a few in and then let you keep going. Um, so Rich, hi, Brent and Mirvon. Brent taught me a long time ago in, in Northern California to concentrate on an area above the net for my shot placement instead of a spot on the other side of the net. I love it. And it works. See, there you go. Proof is in the pudding. Well, now right Rich there. is, uh, you know, another one of these guys um, who I mentioned Mike earlier. You know, Rich has just bought into the whole, you know, he just wants to get so much better. And, and so one of the things he's doing besides getting coaching, uh, besides studying the game, besides working on fitness, is he's playing a lot of events. He's playing a lot of tournaments. And slowly but surely, you start to realize that, when you compete, whether it's in league or whether it's in tournaments, is that really your perception of how much you think you have to do to win a point is skewed, is really off. And we end up making too many unforced errors because we think I've got to do more with this ball. Either I don't want them to touch it or if they do touch it, I just, you know, and I think what happens is when you play more of these events, and this is where it happens. This is where the real learning happens. Leagues and tournaments is you start to realize, wait a minute, it's okay if that guy touches the ball over there. And in fact, I want them to contribute to me winning points rather than thinking I've got to hit dingers all day long. There's too much stress you bring to a match when you do that. And, and so the great Craig O'Shaughnessy, um, has come up with some unbelievable stats for us. And one of the great stats is if you win the four shot category uh, per point, meaning that serve is one return is two, 
the server's ball is the third shot and the returner's next ball is the fourth shot. If you win that category, because that is 70% most of the time in all matches from, from the pros. And I know, Oh, Rafa on clay. Come on now. No way. The stats bear it out. If you win that category, if you can win the zero to four shot per point category, you win the match every time. So what you start to do then is, well, okay, then why put all this pressure on myself to hit a huge serve? Why put all this pressure on myself to hit a big return? If the return comes back, this and this whole thing about serve plus one, it's been misunderstood. The plus one makes everyone think I'm going big on on off the return. And okay, if the return is so short, is so weak, is such a sitter, if you want to go somewhat big to a corner or because then the guy over there has to anticipate one side or the other about what you're, and you, so you kind of go big in the middle, fine and dandy. But if you'll win that zero to four shot category, you're going to win the match. So my point is we need to simplify. We need to eliminate unneeded technique. We need to pair away technique that really can't be consistent in terms of producing um, consistent shots. And so, and I think you get that Marbon, by playing, by playing tournaments, by playing a lot of league, um, by playing a lot of events where the results are made public. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, Brent. Uh, great stuff uh, as usual. So we have a, a bunch of questions here, but I will hold them off because you know, some of them may be answered by the, your uh, okay. additional presentation. So yeah, feel free to, share the screen let me and, go uh, look let's let's go back to that video that i showed you before okay and um i sure. want to kind of go through um you're, you're good you can see it oh yeah here we go all right okay so um so what's happening here is the server server is getting ready um hold on one sec get rid of these messages uh, okay. server's getting ready over there. And right now I've got an, a service partner who I know is pretty active on the poach. Um, that's okay. And because I'm really, I'm really focused more now on what was the towel in the drills that I did this week, last week, last month. And as the server's walking over there, I'm kind of got a couple things in mind is number one, what's my spot. And when I look at this, this net over here, you can, you can find a crease in the net. You can find a dark spot in the net or something that would, that would be the same spot as where you put the towel in practice. And now what I'm doing is I'm looking at that spot. I've now, I take my eyes and I now start looking at the, at the ball in the, in the server's hand. And in my mind's eye, I don't have to look back at that spot in the net. I already, I've got it in my mind's eye. So so I know, um, all right, come on, let's go, man. Here we go. All right, here we go. Um, I know, okay, so let me, let me, let me back this up here. Let's go through, let's go through the start, right? If you look at my alignment here, my alignment's not facing the, I'm facing the server, right? I'm kind of at a 45 degree angle. And again, because whatever he serves me forehand or backhand, I want to be able to have the same amount of shoulder turn as, um, you know, from this position rather than facing the net. Here's the forward step into a split step. Now I'm now I see the balls on my left, and all I'm thinking about from here is just get the shoulders turned, just turn them. And when you turn the shoulders, the racket automatically goes back. I'm now thinking about my spot. What's my spot? Well, my spot is, is right. And where's this ball land? Oh my God, hmm. man. If nice. I could bottle that, I could, I could be a gazillionaire. Um, <laughs> so tough. So same thing. I've got my spot. I'm looking at it. Right. And again, it's a crease in the net. Maybe this is, maybe we're, 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 uh, you know, a set into it now. And I just take a quick glance at that spot again, just to make sure it's embedded in my mind's eye that that's my target, a spot above that crease in the net. And um, I've, I've found the ball. 
And uh, let's see if we can make this work. Okay, here we go. Again, into the into the split step forward. And again, I'm thinking soft hands, soft hands, because that allows me to get the shoulder turned. I don't see him going. I don't even know he's going because my my visual, my eyes right now are looking down at the ball. I'm not concerned about if the service partner moves because I've got my spot in mind. My shoulders are turned fully. The racket's back all by itself, and I'm swinging to my spot. I look up, and I go, oh, the guy's moving. <laughs> the guy's moving, and mm. I've hit my spot. I've hit my spot. Again. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Is there a magnet over there? What's going Might on? Be. Might be. <laughs> Might be. Same thing. I'm facing. I've kind of at a 45-degree angle here to the court. Um, I've found my spot. I'm looking at the ball going up. I'm not looking at the server. I'm looking at the ball going up. And this is the second serve. And, and so what am I doing here? I'm, I'm, I'm letting these guys not know what I'm doing. And I'm throwing up a lob. Even though I could have chipped this cross court, I just kind of felt like, why not throw in a lob? Mm, and wow. there it is. That's a really good shot. <laughs> mm. Ooh, nice. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of guys would go, well, you know, why didn't you close more? Well, you know, we, you know, we've talked about adjusting, right. And, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons I don't close on this is because this opponent is notorious for taking anything like this and lobbing mm -hmm. over, over, over this corner. So I'm, I'm having to kind of look for it, but you, you can say I'm in no man's land, but I don't look at it that way. Right. I'll, I'll I mean, I can volley from here. I can have volley from here. Uh, if the guy hits a short ball, let the ball bounce up. I can drive it, you know, or I can protect against the lob and, and just go ahead and just kind of carve the volley in, into the open court. Yeah. Um, got to know your opponent. You got to know your opponent. And that's the whole, that's the whole thing with going, you know, with going to school. To school. So, yeah. Um, all right, let's go, let's go with some, any questions on this? Uh, oh, we have a ton of questions. Let me see if there's any pertinent to this one. I wouldn't say so, but there's a lot of different, yeah, questions. So I can hold them until. You know what? I like uh, John John Judges here, which is what's the strategy against different formations like the I or the Australian? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, let me go back to the video and uh, sure. See how do I get back to it? Well, From. let's do this. I'm going to yeah. stop the screen and I'm going to come back and reload it. Sure. Um, that's a great question. And yeah, so let's go back here. Sure. All right. So I formation, I formation, which I love, which I love. And I'll give you guys a little help on if you're the serving team in the I formation. But if, 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 if this guy's in the I formation and he is straddling and he's down, right? I don't know what they're going to do, right? Especially, um, you know, especially if they've got some quickness. If they're not quick, then I assume that, you know, if they're serving to me over here, that they're not going to cross over. And if they're playing the Australian, in this case, which would be where the, you know, where the, uh, servers partners on this side of the court and the servers back here by the T I just always am going up the line. I don't care if this guy moves out of the Australian. It's so far to go that I just, I just, I just, I'm just going up the line every time. Right. So here's what I'm going to do um, out of the, uh, if, if I'm returning against the I formation and God, I wish I had the video teed up for that. Um, it might, you know, we might, we might do that next time. But if they're in the I formation, um, the way that I know whether this person is going to cross this way or maybe take a step over here is not by watching them, but is seeing out of my peripheral what the server does. So 
if the server plays their serve, and they typically are be serving from right about here, and they take a step in this direction, well, I know that's where the server is going, and that's where I'm going to play my return. If the server out of my peripheral plays their serve and their first step is over here, well, I know that this high formation partner is going this way, so I'm going to go back cross court. So I'm always keying on the server's movement and not on the movement of the of the server's partner in terms of where do I want to or which which what's what's going to be open? Is it going to be cross court or is it going to be is it going to be up the line? And again, if they're playing Australian. I don't care if the guy goes. I kind of hope he goes because if I can get mine up the single sideline here, it's going to be a really tough volley. But out of this, out of this eye formation, I can't, you know, key on the server's first step. Where do they go? And that's going to tell you which direction to, to return to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's tough when you play these, these teams like that. And I like to, employ those plays myself because as, as you mentioned a lot of people aren't doing what you have taught us today and instead they're paying attention and they're very worried about the uh the service partner so i um, really appreciate the advice there um, and, and, and here's the yeah. other thing and, and i'll just you know if, if you're the if, if you're the service partner in the i formation you don't want to take the one step to the side that you're going to cover and be done with it if we're serving to the ad court, and I'll be honest with you, most of the time out of the ad, uh, out of the uh, I formation from the ad court, I'm going to cover this side just because I don't know the forehand out of the servers, usually a little bit better, you know, maybe not. So if we get the return up the line, we don't care because it's going to my servers partner who's got a good forehand. Right. But out of this formation, you've got to show if you're the servers partner out of the eye, one big step, one step, not a shuffle steps, but one big step that's a fake poach. That if nothing else for that moment hides where your serving partner is going to cover, right? Before we talked about key on that first step from the server. Well, if you throw in one fake poach step here, you might hide that. But the other thing you might do is you might visually distract the returner from knowing what to do. And uh, so I always throw in a big fake poach and then come back. I like it. That's a great strategy there. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, so many comments here. You know, I think oh. Alan Miller's, I mean, Alan talks about how concerned you should be about covering the alley. Yeah. The only time I'm concerned is if, is if the guy's gone there a few times. And he's and he's and I'm the service partner and he's and he's hurt me. Um, and assuming Alan's talking about um, about the server's partner. Uh, yeah. Then I'll go ahead and I'll sort of invite it. I'll throw in a big fake poach and come back. If I know he's going up there, if I know where the guy's going, I've got the advantage. And and the fake poach to me as a service partner is like I tell my partner. You know, if I give you if I give you the stay signal, that really means I'm fake poaching. I'm never just static. I'm never just standing there. I'm always trying to visually distract one way or the other, or I'm always trying to visually distract and make them believe that I'm poaching and then come back and get the ball and have the ball to me. So um, the chances of someone beating you up the line with their return to serve as winners over and over is so rare that I'm not, I'm not concerned about it. Yeah. I remember there was one match where my partner was, was significantly weaker than myself. And so I actually like poached on pretty much all of his serves and it, the other team never had returned down the line. It was ridiculous. There uh, there's, you, you get some Love teams it. that are just clueless. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that was fun. Um, let's see. Hey, Rich playing dubs with your, Oh, awesome. Cool. Got some connections here. Um, Let's see, Stephanie, does the same approach apply when server and partner play in the middle? Well, I'm serving that's is that the I formation? Uh, I think maybe if Stephanie could uh, clarify, that would be good. I'll look out for your 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 reply there. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, Irvin, how do you think about changing your return if the server's partner is left handed? I don't. I don't, I, I, you know, again, I, I will go to school the first couple of games and it might be if the server, if, if, if the server's partner is left-handed, 
then they probably feel more comfortable when when their team is serving to the ad side because they've got their forehand volley in the middle. Not that that means the backhand volley is a liability, but um, again, I'm just going to see how they react. And if they poach more on that side, on the ad side, than they will uh, than they do on the do side, then again, I'm going to lob. I'm going to drive some balls right at them, and and just try to get them to stay there, because I want that cross court lane open, especially on big points. You know, if we get into a tiebreaker or whatever, um, you know, I want to go as high percentage as possible, and uh, and and yet if they're if they're poaching a ton, then all right, I'm going to lob, man. I'm going to lob or I'm going to take a ball that I feel really confident that I can drive it at you um, and not make an unforced error. And look, I'll tell you the other thing is we take more time lobbing than we do driving it at that, uh, at that service part. And we kind of rush the drive. We try to, you know, we try to get rid of it and we try to hit it too big. And if you, if you at 65, 70% power, if you go ahead and put it right at that, at the chest height of that service partner, they're not going to get out of the way. They're just not going to do it. And any volley in here is, is, you know, probably going to come back. That's all right. Um, and you'll take it from there. But uh, I, I just encourage you to practice that from time to time where you go, okay. And maybe drive is not the right word. Drive kind of connotates going big. And it just you know, like, let's be real. You know, at the skill levels we're at, if we go too big, we lose the point a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, let's see, Mike had fair results back in the day versus Norm, John, Chris, and John Wong just returning hard down the li- down the middle. Sorry, because Wong went so often. Yeah. Smart. Yeah, I know the I know those two guys. Yeah. Yeah, I figured. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Uh, uh, used to be a great doubles team. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know what John's doing, but he hasn't played for a long time and norm recently has got some challenges. So mm. he's not, uh, he's not playing as well. I gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well, all the best to them. And in um, fact, in fact, uh, norm Chris used to be one of, he was one, one of the original big time ATP umpires chair, chair umpires. Oh, yeah. Wow. Super yeah. cool. Super cool. Um, let's see some more comments here. Working with Jeff going to Napa. Nice. Um, great stuff. Hello from me, Pete. Sweet. Um, nice, Mike. Uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. Uh, great to see you again. I'm very, very short. 411. Eh, you know. uh, I often find in doubles that when I try to follow a short ball in, even if I think I hit it well, they immediately hit a deep lob over my head. How do I avoid that? Yeah. So um, I can see why. I would do the same thing. And, you know, um, uh, I'm going to... <laughs> Give, I'm, I'm going to take what they give me, you know, and if I've got a shorter opponent, then, then the lob is, is, is that, you know, it's a great play. So Jamie, here's what I would do. Typically when they lob is they're lobbing from the baseline and what you're doing and you're even saying um, to try to follow a short ball in. And even if you hit it well, well, you probably hit it too well. And what happens is, even if you hit it well, and that's kind of a loaded term, um, but they're they're now stuck back in the baseline. And so, th- so the obvious play is to hit a lob. So what I would tell you on a short ball is I would play it short. I would not, you know, I would play, you know, a, what 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 looks like show them a, show them a couple of deep balls, let them let them do whatever they do. Um, but then on the next one, make it look like you're coming in with another deep ball and play it short, whether it's a drop shot, a drop volley, a drop approach, you want them, if they're going to lob you because you're short, you want them lobbing you from well inside the court. So I would get out there and practice short volleys, not sitters, but the low kind of short where the ball skids and stays low, but they have to come up inside the baseline, well inside the baseline to be able to, to play the lob. The other thing, Jamie, is man, get out there, and hit, you know, a bucket of overheads. Have someone and just get really confident on it. Get super confident. 
just get really relaxed on the release when you're when you're hitting it. Make sure your racket shoulder is going up into the ball when you're making contact and you're just releasing the wrist and getting some natural power. But there's no reason, doesn't matter what height you're at, that you can't have an outstanding overhead. And so I would find a practice partner and for the first 15 minutes of that drill session after your warm up, have him hit you a boatload of lobs from the cross court as if you're playing doubles and go back and just just hit them. Um, and over four months, five months, six months, doing that a couple times a week, all of a sudden, and you won't know when it's going to happen, your confidence is going to go, God dang it, I can do some damage with this overhead. And once you do some damage with it, they might stop lobbing as much. They might go, well, we got to do something, something, something something different. So, um, yeah, there you go, man. I mean, those are, I play the volley short. I play the return short. I'd make them, if they're going to serve and stay back, play it short, draw them in. You come in. Sounds like you love coming up to net. That's great. Um, but if they're going to lob you, they got to lob you from well inside the baseline and not either on top of it or from behind it. Yeah. Great points. And, um, regarding the practicing the overhead, I mean, I was at a camp um helping Gigi fernandez a couple weeks ago there were like i think eight of us or so coaches it was super fun amazing group um but yeah you know a lot of the 303 fives even 40s they really had trouble when we did the overhead uh session so and i just you know a lot of them don't really practice it enough so if you are confident in your overhead you're going to really clean up i think uh, i mean look huge. uh look everyone's not everyone but you know if if, if you're working full-time and then if, and if you're raising a family, time is so limited. So if you've got a little amount of time, man, I would use that time to go out there and, and like Maribon just said, carve out 15 minutes for the overhead and then give, then reciprocate and give your practice partner 15 minutes or whatever they want to do. Maybe they want to work on their overhead. Outstanding. You get to work on your lob, but, um, you got to, you got to work, you got to practice and you got to be super consistent with your practice. You can't go out there one time, two days before the big league finals in surprise Arizona and hit a bucket of overheads and hope you got it. Hmm. It's a lifestyle. That's a life. That's true. That's, a life. that's awesome. Uh, Brent, I don't know if you had any more like, um, uh, slides to share before I keep asking these questions. Um, wasn't sure. Um, no, just, you know, the, 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 the other slide I've got is that practice slide. Um, oh, right. Okay. And other than that, I mean, I've shown it here. I can, I can, I can bring that up again. Uh, this is really a great drill. And um, for, for returning, sir, but it's also a great drill for, where are we here? Uh, I guess no it's problem. this one here, right there. Let's see. It should, oh, there we go. I see it. And yeah, yeah. Yep. Sweet. So not only is it a great drill for the return with the towel and finding a spot, an area above the top of that towel that equates to this corner, this intersection here. But when you, when you transition in and let's say you play a little, you know, a little chipper or a little dipper and you're moving in and now you play a ball that's two or three feet behind the service line. Again, don't be concerned with this player. Don't be concerned with the server. Start thinking of, well, what's my spot above the top of the net that I want this ball to travel? And once you get up here, and this happens all the time, um, now all of a sudden you guys have worked yourself in the point to where, you know, you get, you get this guy and he pops up an easy but high forehand volley. I shouldn't say easy because a high forehand volley or backhand volley, not that easy when your brain goes into – Put this away. Put this away. Don't let it come back, man. And what we typically do is we bury it in the net. You know, we and, and so again, what I now what I think about with this shot is I think about what's the height over the net that I want this ball to travel. And and wherever I hit it, because even if this guy backs up a little bit and is in here, I can't assume that that this player, the service partner, is going to stay right there. I don't know they're going to stay. They, they might anticipate that I'm going here in the middle, or they might anticipate that I'm going, I'm, I'm going here in the alley with that, with that high forehand volley. So all you can do is you can really make sure that you don't start peaking 
right? You don't P-E-E-K, start looking to your target too early where you're going to miss hit it and, and, and probably miss the shot. Or that you start thinking winner or I got to put it away. Because again, this guy can anticipate where he can guess where you're going to go. And you could, you could drill it there and say you're going to hit a winner. And now he's there and he gets it back to you and you're not ready. So what's the height? You want this ball to cr- uh, travel across the top of the net and never a guarantee. Never, ever a guarantee. But if you get the ball to cross the top of the net uh, at that height that you want, chances are really good that you're going to win the point. Nice. Nice. Love that. Thanks, Brent. Um, sweet. Let's see. Back to the questions. <laughs> oh, so, Mike, uh, there you go. Proof's in the pudding again. Just charted a match. 72% were less than four shots. I won 14 more of those points and won the match. Love yeah, that I charted. mean, um, Mike's right, and it, it it does. I mean, through juniors, seniors, amateurs, college, even the pros, even even the pros. If you can win the four shot category, you're going to win the match. And sometimes, yeah. sometimes what I have to do is I have to I have to count those four shots. So my strategy is when I hit my serve, I go one, I go one. I've got my target. It's a spot above the top of the net when I'm serving. If I'm serving to the body, again, I look at the net and what's that crease in the net or the dark spot in the net, and I'm going to serve over that. I'm not thinking depth or anything. I'm just thinking over that. And I know if I hit that spot above the top of the net in my serve, it's not going out. It's not it, – it's staying in. But I start – I say one, and the return comes back, and I don't give myself any pressure to do something great with serve plus one. I just go one, and then whatever comes back, my first instinct is, okay, let's take this back in. Let's play a, a slider cross court deep, and I just go two, and the ball comes back, and I say three, and the next thing you know is, oh, ball didn't come back. Okay, I won the point. All right, one, all right, and two. Oh, I won the point. Ball didn't come back, right? I didn't hit a winner, but the guy missed it. All right, so – a strategy could be in singles uh, or in doubles. And I'll, I'll give you another, I'll, I'll give you another thing here that I got from the great Erica Smith uh, about practicing for doubles, but you could use this as a strategy. You could count in singles one, two, three, and just trust whatever your initial instinct shot choice is. And without, without questioning it is just go, I'm serving to, I'm serving to the body. Okay. Toss goes up. Don't go. No way. I'm going to go out wide. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm going to the body. Okay. Ball comes back. What's your instinctive, your initial shot choice? Have clarity on that. Stick with it and just count through. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you no matter where you play your shots, if you count them out, you're going to be more consistent as a shot maker. You're going to win more points. You're going to win that four shot category. So let me get back to Erica Smith, who is from Northern California, a good friend of mine um, and a good friend of, uh, you know, Mike and, um, and Rich and I probably, you know, probably some others on the, um, on, on this broadcast, but she's won at least 25 national titles, um, mostly in women's doubles. And I asked her about, I said, you know, when you go and practice your doubles, what are you working on? And she goes, well, we work on the cross court points, right? So it's just two of us. One person serving the and and typically if it's with your if it's if it's with your regular doubles partner, I will only serve to the side that they return on in our in our partnership. Occasionally, maybe we'll move over. Um, but what she says is she she counts and she says if I can get to three, so if she's playing a return one and she starts moving in, she plays her transitional shot and she says two, and then she plays her first volley. Let's say that's now inside the the service line three. And she knows that if she is winning the three count in practice, she's set to play a tournament. And so um, I would encourage everyone to do that. Play some cross court doubles points and just, can you make your first three shots? And if you can, you're going to win such a huge majority of points too often. What happens is we go, I got to go big in the return. Oh, Oh shoot. I missed it. All right, I got the return back and play, but now I gotta I gotta do something big here with this next shot. Huh, missed it, darn it. 
all right, I've made my first two shots. Here's that sitter volley. I got to go big. Uh, missed it. So you've got to make shots, obviously, number one, right? And I think what you'll find is if you do that, your whatever your confidence level is in the match will start to grow and grow and grow and get bigger. And what you'll find is when your confidence gets bigger, you're not hitting bigger shots. You're now not playing in the zone. You're just not missing. You're just not missing on standard shots and you're putting the pressure on them where they feel like, God dang it. I got to go bigger because he or she's not missing. Well, what happens when they go bigger? Thank you. Right. Unforced error. So that's a great practice drill. And that's what I do now is I just think about, can I make my first three shots in that cross court doubles drill? And if I can, I'm ready to go play. Yeah. Yeah. Consistency there. It's, it's awesome. Um, Let's see where are we at here. Uh, and I'm good on time. I'm 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 fine on time. So awesome. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, okay, so Bill, hey Bill, uh, when I return against an aggressive poacher, I manage them with an with extra alley, lob, and body shots, and follow it in for a second chance, just trying to get fifty fifty results to neutralize them. I like yeah, it. Yeah, and well, look, if you, uh, I, I would say, Bill, if you're doing that, you're 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 doing better than fifty fifty. Um, in terms of if results mean winning, winning points. Um, yeah. And that's all you can do. And he's right. I mean, he's the one who's in charge. And I love that mindset. You know, I manage them, which is the mindset. I'm in charge and you can poach all you want. But if you're going to do that, then I'll take what you give me. And what you're giving me is the lob opportunity. Even if you don't poach, the lob's going to be there. And even if you don't poach, it's in that server's uh, uh, returners. I mean, the service partner's mind. And, you know, you never know. A server might say, hey, man, you know, you got to cover the lob. You know, I, I, I can't be covering every one of these lobs. And so I love it. That's just that's just a great mindset. And I would say, Bill, you're probably doing better than 50 50. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good stuff. Uh, well done, Bill. Um, let's see. Lynn, love this, Brent. I was New England dubs uh, champ, I think, back in the 1970s when all divisions played together while I played at a small college in New Hampshire, can't wait to listen to the rest of the presentation. Awesome. Awesome. Good cool. job. Cool. Good Very for you, cool. Lynn. Well done, Lynn. Michael, oh, uh, how many of the double faults? So that's for Michael to answer. Um, like the way returners partners facing net player to start. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. That's not right. No, okay. no. Like the way the, re oh, the returners partner. I'm sorry. That wait, is right. Partner. Yeah, yeah. No, that is right. Oh, um, okay. okay. Now, look, so let's, so let's talk about that. Um, and this goes against the grain and, you know, I don't know if you're in the same camp, Mayor Bond, most, most coaches aren't. Um, but I'm not a believer that when I'm, when I'm up at net and my partner is, is returning serve that once the sir, once I see the server's not deep, I'm helping him with the call that I automatically look at the server's partner to see what they're going to do. I want to look at, I want to peek at my partner, my returning partner to see what they're going to do. Because the sooner I get information about what they're going to do, the sooner I know what I'm going to do. And it could be that I can see that they're getting a forehand and they're now, they're just, I can see on their setup, they're just going to unload on it and it's going cross court. I'm now going, okay, I'm going to start moving in and, and I'm looking for a poach, Right. Now, this is assuming that the server's partner is not poaching all the time. And the reality is, and I think if we were to videotape or chart um, league doubles matches at the 3 5, 4 0, 4 5 level, uh, that there's not a lot of poaching going on. There just mm -hmm. isn't. So to yeah. think that you've always got a key cross court on that that person who's at net cross court from you that they're going to give you the right information about about what your about what your partner's doing it just doesn't I, I i just don't believe it now if i've got a if if i've got a service partner who's poaching a ton then it's different then it's different especially on a first serve then i might key on them uh because the first serve typically is tougher to return than the second serve but if i've got a if i've got a returner partner that can take second serves and 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 be able to to ding across court or be able to know when to lob um 
I want to know that right away. Then I look, I, I know this goes against the grain. I know that it's, it's maybe it's easier to say, you know, always key on that, that, that net player cross court from you. But, and the other thing is, you know, player coaches will say, well, once you turn your head, then, you know, you lose track trying to turn your head back and forth. Baloney. That's just, that's just not right. So um, anyway, if it works for you, to only look cross court at the at at, at, at that cross court uh, net player, stick with it. But you know, if you watch like you know the Brian brothers, they say well, the Brian brothers look back, look they back do. a lot, <clears throat> yeah, a lot. And what are they trying to look for? They're trying to see, you know, is their partner in trouble back there? <laughs> well, if I find that the serve's going in and my partner's all tied up with stroke technique and it looks like a short lob's coming, <laughs> I know now I got to start backing back up. up. <laughs> I don't want to wait for that service partner to unload on me and go, Oh, I better back up. <laughs> so, um, anyway, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of my, that's my feeling on that. It makes sense. I mean, I think you, you compromise a little bit depending on the situation as well. So, but yeah, I, the first thought I had was Brian brothers as well. Um, them looking back, uh, let's see, Bruce, Brent, do opponent teams use I formation to offset your towel spot cross court returns? Please discuss. From time to time they do. I mean, if, if I'm in the, you know, if my partner or I are kind of that day for whatever reason, and who knows if we can figure it out, you know, I, I bottle it and sell it. But on that day, we just happen to be returning consistently cross court to that, to that spot. Um, then good teams will go ahead and, and throw in the I formation or they'll throw in the, they'll throw in the Australia. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, we talked about this. Well, what do I do with the I formation? I key on the server to see where they're going to go. And, um, and wherever their first step takes them, that's where I, that's where I go ahead and play my return. Again, the Australian, I'm just going up the line all the time, all the time. And it's pretty rare when a guy, I mean, the only time might be is if I'm in the ad court and the guy serves down the T to my forehand that the Australian guy might move. But even if I play my return and boy, that's such a natural cross court feeling on the, um, of, you know, from the ad side down the tee with my forehand in terms of swing, swing direction, I just feel like I can kind of let it go. And if they want to cross on that, go. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, let's see a lot of comments though, which is great. Mike T only one ace in the game first. Okay. Some stats there from his match. Very cool. Um, let's see, Dan, are you a fan of the I formation? Big time, <laughs> big time. I mean, um, you know, my wife and I, uh, you know, a little, a little brag here and, and she's the reason why. Um, but we've won eight national husband wife titles, right? Eight, eight, eight gold balls. Decent. And, and, and she is the reason when she's playing her level, and she's she's an NTRP computer rated five zero, so right. she can play. And yeah. uh, and as long as I can, you know, I'm a computer four or five. As long as I can hold my own, we do okay. Um, when she's serving, we go to the I formation a lot. When the woman is serving, I mean, when the woman is returning. Because we don't want, and, and, and I'm not saying this happens all the time, but typically, you know, the guy is stronger. And I'm, I'm just saying that's just a reality, not critical. Occasionally, we played a few teams for the woman, you know, off the tour and married to some guy who's okay. But typically, we don't want her to return cross court and put the ball in front of the really good guy. So we'll go I formation um, against the woman. And because we want her to return up the line um, to my wife, my, that's just, that's just what we want. Keep it away from being in front of the guy. And, and we've had to do this several times where uh, I'm thinking of this one match, Mikey Landauer. I mean, Phil and Mikey Landauer, Phil's one of the top guys. I wouldn't at least 45, if not 50 national titles and singles and doubles. She's the same. She's really good. I mean, she's got the best Eastern, full Eastern grip, top spin backhand, one-handed thing I've ever seen. And we played them in the finals of the grass courts one year. She's in the ad side. 
And my being a lefty is serving lefty and it's just drifting over to this beautiful backhand and she's just crushing it cross court, putting it in front of Phil and we're having problems holding serve. So, so we went I formation and, and I said, I want you to serve out wide to that backhand and let's see how she does going up the line with it rather than naturally going cross court. And I think I alluded to before my would serve and I take one big fake poach step to my right we're going to the ad court and trying to distract. And there were enough times where she bought it, thought I was crossing and she returned back to me. Thank you very much. And that, that, that change right there, changed the match. And, you know, we ended up winning in three. Um, nice. But I just think there are, there are, I just think it's a great serving formation. And again, the, the net player, the service partner, you got to throw in a fake poach. Two reasons. Number one, you want to disguise where your partner's moving to, the serving partner. But number two, be a visual distraction. Be a visual distraction up there. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, let's see. Try to get through a few more. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Great tip. Setting yourself at 45-degree angle. I, and I will incorporate that on my return game. Yes, face the server. Excellent. Um, then we have a bunch of stats here, which is super cool. And then Frank has a question. Um, oh, actually two questions. What is your advice on when to time the poach? And then question two, after you first volley, should you volley deep to keep the ball in front of you or to the T or opponent's feet? Thanks and great job. Okay. What is your advice on when to time the poach? Again, I have to go to school on this returner. I have to know what are their tendencies? Um, and so, and, and, and here's what I do. If I'm not exactly sure what the perfect timing is, and I don't think there really is perfect timing against, you know, there, there's no generic perfect timing as when to poach because every returner has got some different characteristics the way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so, 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 so you really have to kind of go to school on them, but what I'm going to do, and I mentioned this to you before either I poach or I fake poach every time I am never static. But the third thing I love to do is I like to throw in an early fake poach. Yes. And then I come back and the returner thinks, Oh, that's an early, that's an early fake. They're now back. I'm going cross court. And just before they hit it, then I take off and go. So you show them the one step. It's not a shuffle. It's just one kind of jab step out. You come back, but you got to do it early so they buy that it's an early fake. And then just before they hit it, you got to go. And and it works a lot. I'm not saying it's a guarantee. And this is why this is why someone says, well, what's the formula for for when to time the poach? There is no perfect timing. The guy could over there be guessing that you're going to poach. And you could have the perfect timing and you go. But he's already guessed in his mind that you're that you're going to poach on this, and he just goes up the line, just bunts it up the line. Nothing great, but it's a guessing game. So don't get in your mind that you that 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 there's some fail safe. It'll never ever fail you. Formula. Um, the best way to time on this given returning opponent, throw in a lot of fake poaches and see what they do. And then throw in a fake poach and see what they, I mean, throw in a fake and a go and see what they do. And again, you want to get, you want them to feel that you're the one in charge as opposed to the returner feeling that way. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Um, and then I guess after your first volley, should you volley deep to keep the ball in front of you or to the T or the opponent's feet? Your first volley. Okay. Um, after your first volley, should you volley deep to keep the ball in front of you or to the tee or opponent's feet? Thank you and great job. Okay. So, I mean, this could be either when you're serving or when you're returning, right? You play yeah, a little. Um, so, again, to go back to, I think it was Jamie's question, which is um, what are their tendencies over there? Do they serve and stay back? Do they return and stay back? And when they stay back, do they want you to volley deep? Because then they're going to start the lob fest. But what do they what do they want you to do? Well, I'm going to give them the opposite of what they want me to do, right? 
They want me to volley deep. I'm going to volley short, right? They want to play serve and volley. I'm not going to volley deep. I'm going to volley at their feet, right? Um, am I going to go to the tee? No, if I'm, if I'm playing an outside volley, so if I'm in the ad side and I'm a right-handed player, if they play to my backhand, that's, that's my outside volley. Trying to get the ball to the tee with that volley Man, you're putting it right in front of that net partner in front of you. That's a tough ball to play. If they play an inside volley to me, which is from the ad court, I'm a right-handed player, and I have a forehand volley, well, now the tee opens up, right? So there's some geometry here that dictates your shot choice. And, and you know, everyone says, well, you know, down the middle solves the riddle. Not all the time. Not all the time. If you're playing, if you've got an outside volley and you go down the middle, um, it could be that you're laying it right there in front of that, that net player in front of you. Um, and you're just really squeezed in the middle. I like to play it in the middle more when I get a ball that's, that's in my inside volley. So if I'm going to do side, I play serve. I come in, I got an inside volley to my backhand. That's when I'll play more down the tee. Um, you know, if that's what, that's what they don't like. Nice. Nice. Great stuff, Brent. Um, Audrey, what do you think of when you're getting ready for an overhead? Well, for me, what I'm thinking is um, a couple of things. Number one, I want to get my feet. I want to get my feet back as quickly as possible. I want to assume that as I'm measuring the depth of the, uh, of, of the lob, I want to assume it's going to be deep because if it's not deep and once I, and look, let's be real honest here. The first nanosecond you recognize it's a lob, we're not 100% sure what the depth is going to be. We don't know how deep it's going to be. Now, eventually, maybe nanosecond number two or nanosecond number three, you go, oh, I got it. It's deep, it's medium, it's short. But I'd rather err on the side that it's going to be a deep lob because if now I go, this is medium, I can put the brakes on and I can position myself behind it so that when I hit it, I'm playing it not only with some forward momentum technique wise, but I'm being able to reclaim my net position, right? The worst thing I see, and I used to do this, had to make a conscious effort to change it was the ball would go up and I'd freeze wherever it was for a second, trying to gauge the depth. And now all of a sudden I go, "Uh Oh, the ball's deep. And now as I go back to play the overhead, if I, you know, if I'm playing the overhead, the technique's not great because I'm falling backwards, but then I need another step or two backwards just to recover and now I've lost that advantage of being up at net. So that's my that's really my first thought. And I want to be relaxed in the grip. I think too often we get we get tight, we get tense. Yeah. And when you get tight or tense, you don't move quickly. You don't react quickly. So be really comfortable in the handle of the grip. Just be relaxed. And and when I say move back backwards, um, I want to make sure that you move side to side backwards um, that you don't literally back up as you're still facing the net. I've seen too many, too many players back up, they trip, they fall, and it's not a great result. And um, so when I say, when I say back up, it's conditioned upon you getting sideways early with the shoulders and you're side to side stepping, or maybe you're even turning, even though you're still turned and you're looking at the lob forward you're actually moving backwards. You're, you're sort of running in that direction back towards the baseline, um, not side to side. You're actually running, but you're turned, you're turned sideways. to. Um, so I would encourage you to do that, drill that, and what you're going to find is that if it's a short lob, oh, boy, you're going to unload on that overhead. You're going to stop, and they're going to move forward. Uh, it's a great feeling. Yeah, all that forward momentum. And, yeah, great advice about, you know, um, the relaxation and feeling – your grip, you know, and, and in Tampa with the camp I mentioned um, earlier, we had Jeff Greenwald on who is going to come on Friday as well. And he, you know, he had a great session on just like being aware of, you know, what a, a three feels like in terms of tension, what a five feels like, a 10, et cetera. And he mentioned that even though he played very well, he realized um, that he was playing at a seven. And so he reduced it to like a five and then he was playing really well. So anyways, you know, just kind of gauging in that awareness of, of, um, and, and, and that's chart. a good point. I mean, I will go out and I've got a list, um, on my phone of, 
what to focus on today. And sometimes I get out in the practice court. I'm not sure what I want to what I'll pull out my phone. And one of the bullet points is let's measure grip tension or grip pressure. And so when I'm warming up, I'm trying to feel, am I, am I super relaxed? Am I getting turned early and the hands not squeezing? You know, I see a ball on my right, it's a forehand. Am I instantly turning, but I'm feeling what's my grip pressure? Oh, that's just too, I just don't need that strength on it. Because swing speed, quality spin comes from more of a relaxed grip than, than if you're strong. And so that's one of my bullet points when I got practice. Let's today just feel, can we loosen it up? And for me, it's never, can we get firmer? It's always, can we loosen it up? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Let's sneak this one real quick. John, when lining up to return serve, good question. Do you angle yourself to have a 50, 50 chance of hitting a forehand or a backhand, or do you favor one side or the other? You know, I, I go 50, 50. And that was the position that you saw in, in the video. I mean, I'm at a 45 degree angle of the court. I'm, I'm I, don't, I don't know if it's 45, but it's I'm facing the server, yeah. right? My chest is facing the server. Um, occasionally, I mean, I don't know where they're going to serve, right? And if my backhand's my better return on that day, am I going to hedge and move, sort of move over or try to get more shifted so that? I mean, a good server is going to see that. Right. I mean, a good service going, oh, he wants a backhand. OK, well, I'm going to give him what he doesn't want. <laughs> um, so. I don't really do that. I really I, I will it like like with a tossing motion, the ball goes up and I've come into my split step and I know that the server is looking at the ball if it's a second serve. And for whatever reason, on that particular day, I'm just feeling the forehand cross court. Then I, if I'm playing the ad side, then maybe I'll take a step to my left, hoping that I can get around and hit a, a forehand. But if I can't, so be it. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm always going 50-50 um, just because I don't know where they're going to serve. And I feel like if I, if I show one side or the other, um, they're probably going to serve to the other side. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Uh, let's do one last one. And and for, I, I really appreciate all the questions. Um, we actually are going to have a, a live stream on double strategy with Ian Westerman too. So if we don't get your question in, you know, feel free to come to that one. That's tomorrow. I'm blanking on the time actually, but I'll, I'll let you know, but yeah. How about this one? What do you do against someone with a big serve and active net player? Lob. Lob. I mean, <laughs> If they've got a big serve and uh, I'm not handling it cross court um, and big serve and there's a lot of poaching going on, I'm just going to start off with a lob. I mean, I've got, you know, a lot of guys go, yeah, it's just, you know, so chicken. I go, all right, well, call me whatever. I don't, you know, I don't care. I want to get, I want to get the return and play that at worst it's neutral. I don't feel the need to take uh, to 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 uh, play a return to serve where automatically we've got the advantage. I just I just don't feel that. I feel that if I can play the return neutral, fine. Second shot, I play whatever it is, transitional shot or whatever it is neutral, fine. I don't feel a need that I have to end the point on my terms right here, right right now. And if that means that I got a big server, or maybe on that day it's not a big serve but I just am not returning well for whatever reason, right? This is not an exact science, this whole game of tennis. Some days you go out there, you got it. Other days you don't. One set you have it, next set maybe not. So you don't fight it. You kind of go with it. And to me, the lob is a safe play. And, you know, it gets the ball in play. And if I lob over the net guy, I'm coming in. And now in theory, we're both up at net. I think we have the advantage. So, if you do enough of those, first of all, you'll probably quiet down the net player from poaching a lot. And, um, and then maybe you start to get a read on that first serve. Look, I played guys who come out with a big first serve, first set, and I'm not reading it, not feeling it, what, whatever. But I don't panic. I just assume and I trust that if I don't force it, that it's going to come to me. I don't know when in the match. It may, it may happen in the next service game. It may not happen until four all in the third. I don't know. But 
you make some adjustments um, based on your opponents, based on how you're feeling that day. And the smarter players are willing to make adjustments. Um, and because there's no formula for winning the same way every day against against opponents there just isn't um so and i would tell you guys if we've run out of time here for questions you know you can email me as well i'm more than happy to field uh email questions it's brent uh b-r-e-n-t at web tennis.com w-e-b-t-e-n-n-i-s.com and i'm happy to um and you know the other thing too is if you want to send me an email just give me some feedback on today's um, today's session would love to would love to hear that as well. Awesome, that's uh, the email, right, Brent? At that is it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Great. Let's type that in real quick. Yeah. No, um, Brent, this has been really fantastic and really appreciate it. I also do want to direct everybody to go to Brent's YouTube channel, as I think you may be able to see here, but it's YouTube.com/slash Web Tennis. Uh, Brent has a ton of great content that uh, I've been watching for a while as well, and so yeah, really enjoy it. And yeah, I just want to thank everybody and especially Brent for your time. I mean, I know you are a busy man and, you know, we spent uh, an hour 40 about. So this has been really fun. And, you know, like Brent said, feel free to email Brent uh, questions, which I appreciate. And, you know, come to our other live streams as well. Um, and you can ask questions as, as well on them. I think Ian's uh, is 11 a.m. tomorrow. But uh, Brent, any last words before we adjourn for today's session? No, man, that was great. Always enjoy hanging out with you, Maribon. You do a great job with the Tennis Summit. And, Thank um, you. you know, I just I just love doing this. I just love doing this. It's just a lot of fun. And, and uh, I would encourage everybody um, – to just carve out more practice time. And I know some, some, sometimes it's a challenge to find a, you know, someone else who has the same mindset that you do in terms of practice. But I know that if you play leagues, if you play tournaments that you will meet people, you'll meet players who are obviously doing the same thing that you're doing. And, 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 and look, I, the practice thing for me is I don't want to get, the same player on the same day in my comfy confines at my club or my facility where, 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 you know, whatever I'm going to, I'm going to shove myself into someone's schedule. And I'm going to say, look, let's do one at my place. Let's do one at your place. I want to get, I want to get out of my comfy confines at my club and I want to get out to, you know, wherever they play. Um, maybe they're at a public park where, you know, they haven't resurfaced the courts in 15, 20 years. They haven't washed the courts in 10 years. The lines you can barely see. Um, you know, it's a, some public park where it's craziness going along. They got, they got chain link nets. I love going to those places because when I go play an event, when I go play a tournament, um, there's so many uncontrollables at these events. Whether you're next to the parking lot, you've been assigned a court next to the parking lot where, you know, someone's horns going off or there's a lot of chatter out there. And yet we're, you just practiced last week at a public park, crappy conditions, and there was a freeway above you and you didn't fight it. You just kind of, you just kind of eased into it. So um, just practice, just practice and, and really believe and trust in delayed gratification. Delayed gratification is nice to be the worst at this Maribon. I'd go out and practice. I go, you know, how come, how come that thing is not in my game right now? I just practiced for 11 minutes, man. How come? <laughs> so I finally came to realize that if I believe and trust in delayed gratification of it, put in the time, put in the work, I don't know when the result that I want is going to happen, but if I keep doing it, it's inevitable. It will eventually, it'll eventually happen. And there'll be a day where all of a sudden, whatever you've been working on, all of a sudden you go, wow, it's there. It is there. And, and uh, so you can intellectualize all you want. You can drill all you want. Um, but don't force the result that you want. Just trust if you keep going. And my thing is just, 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 just keep working. Just keep working. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know what else, man. I mean, it's, this, <laughs> <laughs> I could yeah, do this I forever. Mean, so it's fun. Yeah. No, it was super fun. And, and thanks again, Brent. And yeah, I mean, you know, 
feel free to go back through this presentation and especially pay attention to the, to the slides and, but yeah, just so many great nuggets in here. And th thanks again, Brent. So again, every, uh, I encourage everybody to check out um, Brent's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash web tennis. Um, thank you so much. And we got some really great feedback. Um, you know, Rich said, fantastic. Frank said, gentlemen, thank you very much. Jennifer says, good show. Thank you both. Jimbo, superb content and advice. Thank you very much. Marijuana and Brent. Have a great day. Um, so yeah, Michael, thanks. Thanks. Great info. So yeah, I guess we'll end it here and, uh, I'll let you go, Brent, but thanks again. And hopefully we'll, uh, you know, gather again soon and create some more content. So all the best to you. Appreciate it. Thanks. And all thank right. you everybody. All right. Thanks.